Hello and welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piskor. Going to look at Mike Judge's Beavis and Butthead adaptation from Marvel Comics in the 90s. Uh, pretty interesting comic. Quite a surprise, I think, compared to a lot of the licensed books of that time period. Uh, before we dive into this issue, though, want to invite everybody out there to like, follow, and subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe YouTube channel if you haven't done so already. Hit that bell notification. It'll let you know when we post a new video and give you a leg up on the kayfabe effect, which means you'll be the first one in line looking for these Beavis and Butthead back issues uh, on eBay or at your local comic shop uh, before the prices go up or before they disappear from the stock. Um, also, let these videos play through to the end. That allows YouTube's algorithm to share them with other comics fans who haven't found Cartoonist Kayfabe yet. It's one of the major ways we grow this channel, and we appreciate your help on that. So, Ed diving into Beavis and Butthead. It was a phenomenon, right, for, from from a TV standpoint, at least in my life and all of my friends doing their Beavis and Buttheads impressions. Like. Dude, I was I was there when that shit debuted on Liquid Television. Frog Baseball <laughs> could not believe my eyes, and just in the same way that peripheral characters in Beavis and Butthead, when they encounter Beavis and Butthead on the show, they never remember their name. Uh, I only remembered the butthead, so it was like <laughs> beaver and butthead, like what the hell was that thing called? And it made so much sense that that shit would become a TV show because that was something that me and like all my nerd buds talked about. Because like they would have these uh, marathons of animation on uh, on MTV. If you remember, like networks used to do that on like Easter or Memorial Day when they knew that you're home. Right. Uh, they're they're gonna put a whole bunch of stuff on, and they had an animation thing called a cartoon sushi. Uh, one weekend, and we were just looking for that that beaver and butt lips, whatever whatever the fuck it was called. <laughs> it was like that and Aeon Flux on, on Liquid Television. That was the shit. And you know in seventh grade, every t-shirt I had, like, for my <laughs> 11th birthday, was all Beavis and Butthead. In every view. What, there was what one a perfect age view. for it. I was there, man. So... A lot of these things were happening, though, these licenses. I remember, like, Ren and Stimpy was one that got a comic book. They and, and, and they would pop. Like, they would be on uh, Wizard's Hot Back Issue list or whatever. Who knows what arrangement was worked out with Wizard at that point. But I feel like the Beavis and Butthead, this is one of those comics where, like, it's legit good comics. Absolutely. Like, they did something special with this. I, uh, I discovered comic shops when, uh, when Issue 2 was out. So, Issue 1, you know, the... Just a month later, this thing was twelve dollars right. and twenty-two bucks or something. Pulled mine from a quarter bin uh, in recent years, but uh, it was fantastic. And Rick Parker, we we knew his work from the bullpen bulletins, man, where he's drawn Tom DeFalco and other Airzats bullpenners in like single cartoon, single panel, you know, comedic little beats. Every month, there would be a fresh one. I would look forward to those. And Rick Parker, fantastic cartoonist. Yes. And I say that in in the true sense of the word. The lettering looks beautiful with the artwork. That's what I was going to say. Where I would know Rick Parker from is all the Todd McFarlane Spider-Man books. Yeah. Um, you know, did all that stuff with uh, the Spider-Man, not just McFarlane's, but the Spider-Man offices. He was the letterer and had a distinct lettering style. Um, I was shocked whenever I see him doing, like, the full-on comics art and lettering in these yeah um that was a surprise and a really pleasant one i brought this issue because rick had sent this to me we were trading books through the mail um he lettered it up a little bit when is that chick kayfabe gonna get here damn it <laughs> but he said this is one of his favorite issues so uh i thought i'd just bring it along to have that that kayfabe personalization on the cover and show it off but he did the full run of this yes so like a couple of years worth of rick parker really uh I, I mean, as good a cartooning as you're going to find, especially at Marvel Comics in the 90s, like, this stuff stands out, so... I remember at the end of the WWF, like, Tuesday Night Titans, like, whatever those shows are, it said, directed by Kayfabe. <laughs> so, Rick knows what's going on. Yeah. And uh, we're just going to go through issue one here and uh, highlight some of his work and show off this comic, but like you, I've been putting together a run of this mostly from dollar bins, you know, this stuff that's super hot at one point, sometimes it... Uh, it ends up in those in those back issue bins and, and drifts back to us at a regular price. Yeah, you know this because of the license, uh, voluminous amount of copies of this out there in the wild. Though I feel like it's just a direct market book. And like the reason I didn't even know issue one existed was because up to that point, 
the grocery store was where I get my comics. Right. And there was no Beavis and Butthead. How, what a dropped opportunity that is. Yeah. Like, you would think this would... A license of this sort, yeah. you would would have like newsstand value where people are like, I don't know about comics, but I love Beavis and Butthead. Yeah, I think it was also that early period of controversy with the fire and and all that stuff. So like maybe, you know, your wholesome grocery store next to Guns and Ammo and Soldier of Fortune magazine, it doesn't it doesn't have a place. They did a really good job of making this stuff feel. Dangerous isn't the right word, but inappropriate at the least. Like like it was stuff that felt like. I shouldn't be reading this when I'm a kid, or I shouldn't be watching this when I'm a kid. And I don't, I don't know, man. It's kind of amazing. I, I guess that would be Mike Judge his ability to do that. But it, it seemed like whether it's starting fires, <laughs> mutilating animals, whatever it was, it was just like somehow it gets past, gets on air. I mean, but it's, also it's it's just uncomfortable. Yeah, I mean, it took the the sort of immaturity of a middle schooler and ramped it up to twenty six. Right. Like, like I remember, like. In music class, even the music teachers talk about, like, blow the horn. And then all the boys would be like, <laughs> every single boy in class would be like, she said, blow. And the teacher would flip, grow up. Yes. Uh, uh, Dropping a Will Elder Dog siding. whistling. And, right, and it's right in page one. And it's perfect because, like, Will Elder, consummate mad artist known for what we colloquially describe as chicken fat, which is cram as many jokes per square inch as you can. And Rick Parker's of that school, you know, like, so you'll get a lot of that stuff. And he is super on point with the with the characters, which is probably, you know, it's not that hard. You get an autograph machine. There's three or four views yes. of Beavis and Butthead. So you just trace them off at the, at the various sizes that you need. No, no big deal. But every time we get to see Rick Parker's cartooning, whenever the, car, the characters get off model or... or anything like that this kind of thing like that's where the shit really sings like you would never see such a good fucked up bike yes in the cartoon like none of those dudes would know how to draw it that well but parker he's he's exceptional yeah from the get-go like i said issue one here so he hits the ground running um shines in all of his lettering but that dental hygiene dilemma so gross looking <laughs> yeah 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 yeah. <laughs> shots to the perfect. colorist for that one man <laughs> See, even even uh, Anderson is like off model there, and it's just a cool Rick Parker illustration. It is. You he, see little bits of crumb coming through, but it feels like alternative comics at uh -huh. that time period, and uh, that's the direction since that I've gone yeah. in terms of what I enjoy. So, like this stuff looks better now, even than whenever it was first released to me. Yeah, sure, abs absolutely. Uh, I would say where where it is lacking is in the writing, and it's one of those things. Like I know Beavis and Butthead so well. I know what their voice is, and and even when you watch the show, you essentially, once you're acclimated, you know what the next phrase is going to be almost all the time, and it completely drops the ball uh, in, in this situation. Uh, makes me think about the, the Double Dragon comic review that me and Tom did, and Tom suggested that, like, as kids, like, we were so close to the material, like, we knew how that worked, but these are adults. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to make this comic and maybe they watched a couple episodes or something to try to get the vibe or whatever but the 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 writing m misses the mark in fact in fact the the plot of this story it wouldn't be, even be a d level plot of like a beavis and butthead story it's it's real it's real whack yeah um they they do switch like mike lackey is the writer on this issue but that issue 23 it's they've gone to glenn hurdling so I don't know if that's a sign of maybe editorial recognizing that they weren't happy with the writing or something and make that change. Fantastic. This is brilliant stuff. This yeah. is one of the things that they do consistently is, okay, it's a comic book, so what are we going to do? We're going to show comics in it. And they kind of lampoon various Marvel comics and characters and uh, very well, usually. You know, like here we see John Romita Jr.'s Punisher, for example. So... I love that part. I think that's a really smart choice whenever they were figuring out what are we going to do with these guys in a comic book. Brilliant, right? Oh, genius. Head wounds are cool. <laughs> that's the funniest head wound, too. You know, pure... It's so cartoonish. Pure Rick Parker. Yes. Yeah, it's a joy from a cartooning standpoint. And I, lo I love it because, like, we know this guy. You know, it's this dude. We see him in the show. But even that has Rick Parker on it. But Rick Parker, it's like you need more views than what's available. Yeah. So Parker has to extrapolate from, you know, the bones of this 
to get that back view and it doesn't look like it but it's just a cool rick parker drawing right that's that's what a lot of this stuff is with your beavis and butthead models on top of it um that sawed off shotgun's the shortest shotgun i've ever seen in my life hand on the pump all these kind of things too like the grossness coming out of the mouth all those little details feel spot on this whole yams thing like is it because they look like turds or dicks or like what's it's not it's stupid it's really bizarre i was trying to figure out like was there something in the culture headlines or something yeah. with yams at the time because it didn't it doesn't add up to me either not sure what to make of that like having a yam store what yeah very very odd it does look gross though whenever he's like handling it if you go back just just one so we could show people the bullpen bulletin real quick like this is where you would see rick parker's art more often than not in the pages of marvel for for some years man pro even back in like probably the spider-man one mcfarlane mm -hmm. days you would see these tom defalco editor-in-chief cartoons and in the uh in the uh first hip-hop family tree free comic book day comic the one that you designed like i we got rick to do a bullpen bulletin he called it i i realized like he d didn't know how to say Groth's last name because he ca he calls it growth like G R O T H industries, right? Right, <laughs> and and he dr he does like an Eddie P fucking Gary Groth uh, cartoon. That's the, a cool. The, that was a cool idea to include him. Yeah, to reach out. Yeah, I would see him like I met him at shows over sure. the years, and uh, a fun guy to talk to and just talk shop because he was in the bullpen for years and years. So. Mm -hmm. Guy who was there and can tell you some some Marvel history too. Yeah, he was buds with my uh, lettering teacher at the Kubert School, Phil Felix, and I figure I feel like both of those guys were sort of like at the same level in terms of the assignments that they would get, with the exception of Rick Parker getting those Spider Man assignments. But you would see them often; they would do like B lister books more often than not. You know, Phil Felix is doing twenty ninety nine books, and he did the Nom, which is cool, but that's not. Spider-Man, that's not X-Men, you know, that you have Orzakowski for that, and some of those other dude, John, Joe, John Costanza. That's a visual gag, right? Yeah, I think so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and a very gross one at that. In that one too, perhaps? Yeah, there's your yam looking like uh, some kind of anatomy. <laughs> Even here, right? <laughs> you could tell the religion of that, of that tuber. <laughs> Cartoonist Kayfabe is brought to you by the comics that Ed Piscor and I make. Red Room Trigger Warnings, the second season of Red Room, all self-contained stories, issues one to four, now available in comic shops everywhere. Red Room, the anti-social network, the trade paperback collection of the first season of Red Room, now available in comic shops everywhere, minus 28 countries where it's banned in 10 comic shops, but you can still request it there. And coming in September, the collection, the trade paperback of Red Room Trigger Warnings will be in stores in September. You can pre-order that now at your local comic shop or online wherever you buy your books. Hulk Grand Design Monster and Hulk Grand Design Madness in comic shops everywhere. The 60-year history of the Incredible Hulk. I am writing, drawing, lettering, coloring, the Grand Design treatment, retelling that 60-year history, and you can now pre-order the Hulk Grand Design Oversized Treasury Collection, uh, about 40 extra pages in that. It'll be in stores before Christmas, but you can pre-order it now in your comic shops or in your bookstores wherever you're, you buy comics. And now back to our regular scheduled programming. So disgusting. So they end up with these melted gross candy bars, and that's what gets us into the uh, dental hygiene issue. The lettering, man, when he's adding some bubble letters and stuff to it consummate rick parker artwork there man yeah i like beavis even biting this and just standing out with the stars coming out again down to your basic cartooning language right and then adding the little ha ha's excellent thing when you're drawing the whole thing because you could just add a couple extra ha's and not draw behind it that's right <laughs> <laughs> that dates it yeah quite a bit How to sneak home after school and not get beat up. This stuff feels again spot on if you're doing a comic book version of this of Beavis and Butthead, like having these kind of pieces, it's almost like young Archies or something that would be breaking up an Archie comic. That's a Buddy Bradley right there, man. If I've ever seen one. Yeah, with, you're right. With Todd. That's the other thing too, Rick Parker and uh Phil Felix, they much liked independent comics far more than uh the mainstream stuff. 
Makes sense. This almost looks like a Basil Wolverton kind of nod. Some of these, uh, the creatures and line work there. Absolutely. It's cool. They make it a holistic magazine. In, in yeah, that's, that's, that's what I mean with like some of those extra features like that. It fits really well if you're doing like we're making a comic book of this. Yeah, a comic book magazine. So there's activity pages. We'll, we'll get to all that shit. And here we go, man. These kind of money shots. So disgusting. Not far from uh, the like the Bill Ray paintings. And, totally. Uh, and it's of that Red time period. You know, it makes it makes total sense. That's the a total of, Wolverton tongue, by the way. I was going to say, like, the amount of detail that Parker puts in his line work is really impressive. Yeah, absolutely a Wolverton tongue. And and uh, what sells it is, like, the little hints of shadow underneath the gunk. It really adds a volume to it. Yeah, even the texture of, like, the screws on the braces. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> What's that, Succotash? Is that what Succotash is? Ooh, yeah, ooh. <laughs> I didn't even <laughs> catch that. It's so gross. <laughs> Poor dentists. What they must deal with on a daily basis. It made basis. me think of that Joe Quesada Punisher comic or yeah. Venice that we looked at, you know, from the mouth and how gross that was. It's kind of the same, similar concept here. And there's some examples of your chicken fat, the little uh, air, airplane uh, ashtray that, that is like long gone. Yeah, it's so funny, even like an eject button, like he's sitting in some sort of airplane. Yeah, and now chiseling away at his braces. Ugh. It's kind of good stuff, almost could be a horror comic. Sure. Your dentist there with all of his tools laying on top of him. Even a bulge in the dentist's pants as he's like <laughs> pushing. <laughs> One of those Beavis and Butthead jokes, man. Hey, Butthead, your, de your dentist doesn't make you... Put your legs in the stirrups. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's interesting because it's like funny cartooning, right? Dennis jamming his hand down down Butthead's mouth, but then like it's also super intense, right? Like a close up of the of the dentist staring at it, close up of the hook in the mouth. Feels it feels like he's referencing so much com like a guy who knows comics, yeah, and he's just able to put it all on display here, which is one of the weird magics of this comic is that somehow Beavis and Butthead create this canvas where you can bring in all of this stuff. Undergrounds, alternative comics, Jack Kirby Devil Dinosaur. Yeah. Like, what? How does this work? And it's, it's funny... Get that, that laughing gas out and let's look at some weird comics. And it, yeah, it's funny that they would, like, go that deep because this is 1994 they didn't have to go far. Just how about Force Works? <laughs> <laughs> you know what it is, though. They don't want to diminish the brand of stuff you could get a subscription to right then. Yeah, that's probably it. That's the thing. Like when they made comics like that, like they must have known that it's like we're we're just like churning out feces. Well, yeah, that was the whole thing that like Groth and Fanographics were so critical of was their their sales approach, right? Like their idea was we're filling up the shelf space, and then nobody else gets to sell comics because. Stores only have so much shelf space. Yeah, but I'm talking about the poor creative team. Like, do, do they honestly think that they're that they're given like Watchmen a run for the money, or, or you know, what I mean? like they're they're gonna have the next big thing, or is it just you know I'm getting I'm clocking in, I'm collecting a couple of dollars, I'm feeding the fam. That has to come down to from team to team, right? And whatever the circumstances are and where those people are. Because I always think of like New Warriors as being one of those yeah. examples of this book should have been, could have been terrible. It's a bunch of B-listers yeah. and people you've never heard of. And it's launched in the middle of like Spider-Man and Ghost Rider. Like this book is destined to be garbage. This is just some, just fill some shelf space. It turns out to be great. Like you get two creators who, I don't know, man, they just jive together. Mark Bagley, young and energetic. Like that turns out to be a good book that develops into a successful title. So I think it depends on... You know, maybe the creators. You get some 20-year veteran and give them force works, they're probably not too excited. They, they have to recognize this is the D-list of all D-list, and maybe uh, that the work is according. I'll tell you, New Warriors, if they, if they didn't have Night Thrasher and you had, like, another Marvel boy, you know, or a Speedball, it, it wouldn't have been what it was, man. You needed that hardcore dude. We it, digress. We do digress. <laughs> How much fun is it if you're Rick Parker and you get to draw some of this stuff, like add, add in some Devil Dinosaur reference on a page? Yeah, that's a Rick Parker cameo. Oh, yeah. Pretty sure. Yeah, I think you're right, 100%. See, we running, know the, running for his life. We know the white-haired Rick Parker that wears the Ray-Ban joints. 
of course, when we bury the lead, like the the nitrous oxide uh, gets out. Well, that's what I was going to say. That's such the key, right? The the laughing gas into like, let's look at the weirder comics. Right. It's the but, perfect bridge. But it makes everybody laugh. And you notice Beavis and Butthead aren't laughing anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Van Driesen. Yeah, another one of these uh, little side inserts. Van Driesen is so close to just Mike Judge's real voice. He's such a funny looking design. Mm -hmm. Fits really well in this universe. Totally. And so does Todd. Todd is the, a perfect creation for, for this series because of course these little hooligans would like try to impress some older piece of trash kind of guy that they perceive as cool. And when he goes kind of off model, like that's, that's fantastic designs right there. It's very funny. From the swirlies. Yeah. Very creative. It's good. Why do they call them twirlies? Yeah. Right. Here's your activity page that you mentioned. And again, man, you see Rick Parker not phoning anything in. And it's fantastic because it's real. Like you can do this with the Lando Lakes. <laughs> You know, like you go online, you could you could give the Lando Lakes chicks some boobs. That's hilarious. Do you wonder, like, were they like you guys can't show that? You can't show the end results of what you're making there. <laughs> <laughs> or is it best just to leave it in the imagination of all the immature readers out there? It's so cool that they, that they that they went that far because like it's all kind of there, and uh, it brings it to a new generation it's like it's like teaching you know the younger kids in class the milk milk lemonade song or something like you know it's that you're carrying on a tradition right yeah it's funny and all the lettering that he's doing like the glue all that bubble lettering that you've pointed out it adds for really fun. really great pages and now soliciting mail so you got to put in some uh, some fake letters right out in john chevy chase robert de niro <laughs> And, like, you know, let's take it from the frog baseball joint and just such perfect tangents, you know, like totally on purpose. Yeah. Totally on purpose. Hold it down at the root. <laughs> See, that Glenn Hurdling that takes over uh, the, the writing, at least in this one issue, starts out as editor. So maybe, uh, you know, he is looking at it because I'm sure this is going through approvals and things and they're getting notes and... Probably at some point it's just easier to manage that yourself. Talk about like a time period. Absolutely. Always fun to see like what, what all the Marvel subscription books are. And you can see Ren and Stimpy is in there. I don't know if they had any other big licenses. Tech World. Yeah, William Shatner's Shatner. Tech World. Biker Mice from Mars, that was a cartoon. Transformers Generation 2. That shit looked good. That was a good looking comic. I don't remember that at all. I don't know if I've ever uh, looked at one of those. Might be something to follow up on. Um, Clyde Barker's Razorline saga for ongoing titles there. Wachowski's shots of Steve's gross. Yeah. And of course, man, back cover, plug some Beavis and Butthead soundtrack here. Again, this thing runs for like over two years. It's a really good series. And uh, I would highly recommend anybody watching this if you're unfamiliar with these. If you find an issue in that dollar bin or in your store's back issue bins... Like any issue, they're all self-contained, I believe. Yeah. So you can start anywhere. They all feature Rick Parker's cartooning. They're great. I pick them up whenever I see them. You have that issue, Beavis and Can we just see what the comics uh, that get parodied uh, might be in there? I'm just so curious. Yeah, because we'll because uh, that is the funnest feature. Quickie flip through of these things. The the color updated in this one, not as good. Yeah, it looks a little bit more like they've uh, fallen into their into their format. Yeah, like even even Rick is kind of phoning it in a touch, to be honest. We're getting near the end, so I don't know if there are comics in this one. There is a, uh, a prostitution ring running out of um, Intercourse, the yeah, Pennsylvania so Dutch. Nobody from the Netherlands, they point out, uh, settled this place. Yeah, I guess no comics in this one. Yeah, that's bad. See, that was a bad idea to get away from those. Unfortunately, there was a good cum shot joke I just saw with the, uh, with, the, with, the with the cow udders. I'd be shocked if there's only one. <laughs> <laughs> that could be editorial policy. How many of those they can get away with? That was like when, when the Tom Green show came out. That was like one of the things he did. Man, he played played porno music and would go to to <laughs> barns and just have cows fucking milk all over his face. 
All right, so this is fun because it has your circulation statement. And according to this, they were doing uh, 144,000 was the, uh, the most recent total production. That surprises me. It seems really low. It's 94. It's, it's right, right at the collapse, pretty much. Yeah. You know, it's probably that's 95. 95. Yeah, yeah. This is really like uh, the following year, Marvel goes bankrupt. So I guess it is the worst time period. But at the same time, like maybe these had run their course as well. Beavis and Butthead, I mean, by these, like probably two years in, the license isn't what it would have been in the beginning. Yeah. But it still feels like this should have been something to sell, like on newsstands and stuff in big numbers to, to non comics outlets. But Rick, Rick maybe is, they didn't have a good uh, a good inroads anywhere. Rick is getting a hundred thousand units worth of royalties, man. So you ain't crying. That's true too. Maybe I'm looking at this completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hundred fifty thousand copies in ninety five, like for an issue, you know, in the late or in the twenties. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I need to reassess that because that, that's a lot of extra income that you didn't get contracted for every month right pretty cool man you good to go i am k favors like follow subscribe to the youtube channel hit the bell we'll notify you when new vids are available jimmy what's out there hulk grand design the treasury collection the oversized collection will be in stores in december you need to order that now please do so i finished up the design on it and i can tell you this this is the most time and effort i've put into any book i expect it to be the best book that i've made and marvel was on board for some of the bells and whistles including a fluorescent green for the cover yes so this book is going to stand out you're going to want to add this to your coffee table you're going to want to add it under your christmas tree this this holiday season so pre-order that book now and join me on patreon.com slash jim rug Red Room Trigger Warnings trade paperback coming out in September. Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit is going to collect the four issues of the 2022 season of Red Room Comics, plus about 70 pages of extra material, commentaries, uh, first draft comics, uh, comics that you're not going to see anywhere else. Uh, you can hit up my link tree in the description below to uh, order and pre-order those comics. Uh, hit up my Patreon because I am uh, now currently... Um, serializing the next round of Red Room comics before they hit paper on the Patreon, and that they're not going to see a paper print uh, until next year, springtime probably. So if you're starving for Red Room material, hit up the Patreon right now. New strips every Tuesday, almost 300 pages worth of stuff up there. Three bucks for the price there. What else do we have out there, Jim? Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. That's another great way to support the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. Given those marching orders, we'll be on our way, Jimmy. Read more comics.